I'm your host, Ray Dogum, and welcome to Vibecast. The Vibecast is Vibe Bio's weekly informational podcast where we explore some of the hottest topics in drug development and technology innovation. Join us to learn, imagine, question, and help us identify and develop solutions together. Our guest today is Omid Mogdam. He is the founder and CEO of Namida Lab. He is an inventor, entrepreneur, venture investor and educator. He is the past founder or co-founder of nine different companies in healthcare, IT, genomics, diagnostics, and medical imaging. Omid, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Ray. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on your podcast. Excellent. Why don't we get started with you giving the audience a brief introduction to yourself, basically how you got to this point in your career? Oh, wow. It's, uh, it, it goes back a long way. So I've been in, uh, I've been out of graduate school for about 30 years now. And half of that time, I've been in health tech and uh, health tech innovation. And the other half, I've been in just regular tech and regular tech innovation. And um, I, um, I got the bug for, uh, for this, for innovation and coming up with new things early on in graduate school. I was part of a startup in grad school. What was your graduate, graduate degree in? Um, it was... Uh, uh, electrical engineering and computer engineering, which was at the time, it was computer science was was within the computer engineering department. So I would say my background is doubly, mainly signal and image processing and computer science. So the software that uh, that does that type of work. And um, so we were we were in a in a new era of medical imaging at the time. PET, you know, MRI was already in the market. PET was making it to market. So there was a lot of tomographic reconstruction and um, uh, the, the, the early graduate school startup was in uh, thermal imaging, actually use of thermal imaging in early detection of skin cancer. So uh, in a way, with my new venture, I have come back all the way, you know, the whole circle back to early cancer detection from my early days in grad school. Very interesting. I appreciate that. And, you know, you were since then you've co-founded or been part of the start of many companies, uh, but you've, you've also spent some time at Intel, Eastman Kodak. I did. Uh, yeah. So these are large companies as well. Do you want to share a little bit about, you know, your experience there? Say, sort well, of early, early, early career out of, uh, out of grad school, I joined Eastman Kodak and I was given a chance to basically invent new things there. Kodak at the time was, uh, was probably one of the more interesting companies. I think the only, probably the closest company to where Kodak was back then is Google of today. So they had one product that made a lot of money. So they, um, so Intel was basically, you know, had had a very large R and D R and D organization, and you were given it. If you wanted to invent new things, you were given given a chance to uh, to steer the company into new new products and new businesses. And uh, early on, I got into uh, working on digital cardiology. So we basically made the very first all digital angiography system out of there, and that was uh, that was that was very interesting. And um, I exited healthcare at that point after that product at, at Kodak, which was an FDA cleared device, um, and uh, went into digital photography and uh, and uh, printing, inkjet printing, learning about all of those all of those other markets while I was there. I even went into the field, carried the bag, did marketing and sales for Kodak, and uh, ended my work at, as, as an M&A person there in the printing division. And um, I got very interested, not just on the technology side of things, but what it takes to actually market things. And um, I went ahead and got an MBA in finance to learn, to learn more about uh, um, all the aspects, all the different aspects of bringing things to market, not just the invention, innovation, and sort of like the technology part of things. And that is sort of like what got me excited about entrepreneurship and, um, and continuing that, uh, that, that traction of bringing new things to market. I went into management consulting for a few years, mainly working with new things that were coming to market, other within healthcare, within the defense department, I was based out in DC. So we had access to a lot of both healthcare customers and uh, and sort of like DOD and and uh, national defense type customers. After a few years, I got a call from uh, from Intel. They were they were trying to do some new stuff, new stuff in high end computing, and uh, I joined Intel to uh, to head the strategic programs. So we were doing things in what's what's today AI and ML, computer vision, video processing, image processing, three D graphics. So had all these teams that we were working all the new areas, all those new areas and tried our main focus was trying to bring the cost of developing 
applications in those areas down. So Intel, you know, microprocessor manufacturer can sell more into those markets. And I would say we were successful in doing so. It sounds like you've had a huge breadth of experiences and skills throughout your career. And it's interesting that you said, you know, you got into marketing and part of being an entrepreneur is really being able to tell the story around your product or service or what you're trying to offer, you know, the world. That leads me to the question of why did you start your current company, Namita Lab? And then maybe we can get into what problem it's trying to solve. Um, part of it was personal. My, um, I lost my mom about five years ago to cancer and, uh, and she was a 13 year cancer survivor. So, you know, so from, from diagnosis to all the treatments, surgeries, radiation, and all that, the, the, during those 13 years, I saw what this disease does to a person, a vibrant person, like my mom was an athlete, um, all her life and uh, what it did to her and, and how she had to navigate the whole thing. Basically reaching the conclusion that a lot of other people have reached is that you detect cancer early, you can survive it and you can treat it. You wait for it to get too late, you know, wait, wait for it to show symptoms. And that is generally too late. And, um, and my current company is basically out of, is, is out of that interest. You know, the company is called Namida and, um, Namida means tears in Japanese. And, um, there's a, there's a historical, uh, part of in this story, um, there is a bridge that is still today exists in Tokyo called Namido Bashi, which is a bridge of tears. In the Edo period, it actually linked prison to the execution grounds. And that bridge was where the condemned were allowed to say goodbye to their loved ones. Hence wow. the name bridge of tears. That for us is a metaphor for cancer. So we're trying to end, end um, all the tears that are shed over cancer by detecting it early and also we use uh, tears as the medium of testing for finding cancers. So it's a very unique method of detecting cancer. It's not a, a blood draw. It's not a, a biopsy um, and, you know, relatively non-invasive uh, to get some tears out of somebody. So can you dive into more the mechanics of how that might work uh, in terms of, well, why did you choose tears as opposed to sweat, for example? Maybe we can dive in a little bit into that. I mean, the story goes back all the way to mid 2000s and um, the, 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 the idea sort of like the spark came from um, a very well known and well respected and probably one of the top 10 breast cancer surgeons and oncologists in the world by the name of Suzanne Klimberg. Suzanne uh, was the head of uh, breast and ovarian cancer at uh, UAMS, which is Arkansas's teaching hospital and, uh, and, and medical school. She realized that her patients coming in from rural areas always had higher stage cancer than the ones from metropolitan areas because screening for breast cancer is not a convenient thing to do. It's usually time consuming, costly, you know, and uh, you have to go to specialized clinics, which are not available everywhere. And um, she had this desire to come up with some sort of a test that can push that screening from the specialized clinics to General, generalized clinics, so an OBGYN or a primary care, care setting. And at that time, mid 2000s, a whole bunch of new detection technologies were coming to market. And that's where people started looking at things like saliva and sweat and all, all the other fluids of the body. And um, during that time, another Suzanne, Suzanne Love, who recently passed away from cancer herself, um, oncologist at UCLA, had discovered markers of in milk of lactating women, cancer, breast cancer markets, very rare. Our Suzanne thought that, you know, if you can look at the process that milk is developed in the body versus tears, they're very similar because they're, they're both filtrates of blood. And, um, and if you can find it in one, can you find it in the other? So that's where the idea came from. Um, we took that idea and basically commercially proved it. Because at the time, I don't think detection technologies were good enough at the university to be able to prove that. And uh, we took that over later on and, uh, and, and made it happen. So how long did it take from that idea to start doing some of the discovery work, the research, the testing and commercialization at this point? Um, by the way, congrats on the success so far of the company, but can you explain how long that took? What are some of the huge challenges that you had to overcome? Well, um, it took 10 years. So we started this work. We started the com commercial work uh, in 2013 under a different name. And that company was acquired to, to uh, create the company that we have today. 
which is which is four years old. Challenges: If you want to make, if you want to develop a you know blood test, you can you can pick up the phone and call a blood bank, and you would have like a hundred samples at relatively low cost FedEx to you the next day. There are no banks for tears, so basically we had to create the wheel. You know, down the hall from me is probably the largest uh, you know largest. Uh, bio bank of tears anywhere in the world, you know, in, in our minus 80 freezers. Um, so we had basically create everything, you know, we, we basically had to create the method of capturing tears. You know, we had to, we had to come up with all that stuff. So there was, there was a lot of uh, experimentation that went in early on until we figured that out. And once we figured it out, then we had to uh, basically, again, go and collect these samples, which means we had to work with a lot of clinics explain to people what we were doing. And, uh, and then, um, again, we had to figure out all the things that people had figured out for blood because they've been working for it for a hundred years. Like, does makeup affect this? What if you're wearing a contact lens? Does that affect it? So we had to, we had to work through a lot of things that you wouldn't think about when you're uh, when working with, say, blood or urine or saliva. Yeah, yeah. So, so what is the effective way of extracting tears from people? I mean, are you reading sad stories and cutting onions back there to kind of extract the tears? What's the, the method okay. here? Well, we get those questions all the time. Um, you know, we got that question actually in a lot of clinics that we went to uh, to collect samples from women for our breast cancer product. Um, yes, uh, very simple. So Otto Schirmer, a uh, German op ophthalmologist about 100 years ago, he invented a way of um, uh, uh, diagnosing dry eye, which was with a, basically with a piece of filter paper that, that resides on the lower eyelid of the patient. And mm. that's, that's how we collect the tears. Basically, um, you put a Shermer strip in your eye, you close your eye for somewhere around three to five minutes, depending on how, how, um, you know, how wet the eye is. And uh, that's all the sample we need, basically. That piece of paper goes in a tube of saline and shipped back to our lab. And that goes straight into our robot for, uh, for testing. Interesting. That makes, that makes sense. I guess you can avoid any contaminants from the skin if you were trying to collect it when it comes off the skin. So interesting. Um, and, you know, I understand you're investigating breast cancer as a, and using tears as this biomarker. Are there other types of cancers or diseases that can be detected using the same tiers? Oh, absolutely. So we have a, actually, we have a peer reviewed publication on that. Um, tiers filtrate of plasma. So, um, so there are DNA, um, RNA, uh, protein biomarkers, metabolite, anything you can imagine that, that resides in blood and plasma makes it to tiers. Um, it's not quite one-to-one. -one. There is a, there is maybe somewhere between, depending on the type of marker, there's 70 to 90% of what is found in, in blood can be found in tears. However, this is the, the great thing about tears is that if you can see it in tears, you can detect it with minimal cost because tears are highly concentrated and filtered. So there's a lot of stuff that's floating around in blood that needs to be filtered out. And these um, low abundant markers for diseases like cancer, are very hard to see in blood, which means there's a lot of prep work that needs to be done in the laboratory. There's a lot of uh, replication. So you can actually find the signal within a lot of noise. In tears, that signal can be detected fairly easily, which means we don't have to do a lot of prep work, which translates itself in terms of a laboratory test into a less expensive test, which, which we think is unique among what we're doing with tears versus well, you know, others that are trying to do with blood. Interesting. Yeah, I was wondering what the concentration of these different metabolites or, um, you know, components are within the tears. It sounds like you answered my question. It's, it's more concentrated and a little bit cleaner in yeah. some cases, depending on what you're, you're looking for. So that's really, really great. You mentioned the paper. Have you gotten any of these disease, you know, detection mechanisms approved yet? Or is it, is it just in breast cancer for your company now? So in breast cancer, we have a product, we have a lab developed test in the market now. We've had it out there for about a year. It's called ARIA. And uh, we have six other R&D projects that we're working on right now. There is a second version of our um, breast cancer test that's a diagnostic. And, um, and there are five other cancers that we're working on. We're working on melanoma, 
colorectal cancer, prostate, ovarian, and pancreatic. So those are in various stages of discovery. So we have um, uh, clinical agreements with, with cancer centers, and we're basically recruiting patients in there to get samples from there in the discovery of markers. We have, we have targets that we're working towards. And um, you know, as more patients get signed up, more samples come in, we, we refine those and move them into validation stage. But now that, you know, the first 10 years we figured out one test, but we had to basically recreate the wheel four tiers, the wheels that were created for blood and urine, basically we had to recreate it. But now that we know how to do it, um, getting those other tests to market are gonna be a much, much faster process for us. We're thinking each product probably 18 to 24 months before it can get to market. Interesting. Yeah, I can imagine one day maybe you go to your ophthalmologist and they do a screen or a test right then and there uh, for all these, like a panel of cancer. Well, I, so, not even ophthalmologists. I mean, we're, to, in order to get- Or primary these, care, right. Primary care, home. I mean, ARIA is a home. At home test. You get the kit at home today and you collect your own sample and send it back to us and you get your results you know, within a few days. What has been the feedback from users and patients? Um, well, those that, that we have helped uh, find cancers in, they're very grateful. And, uh, and everyone else, various stages of wonder to, you know, how is this possible? Uh, but generally, women are very poorly served with, with the current system. The current system that we, we have in the US uses imaging and, uh, and x-ray imaging at its first, as its first line of screening, which leads to a lot of inconsistencies in that, in that process. Because mm -hmm. it all depends, you know, it's, it's not a laboratory that's test. It's not standardized. It's an image that needs to be read by somebody. If that person is having a bad day or they're just not seeing things correctly, or if the patient has dense breast, for example, x-ray images don't do very well for that. And that basically hides cancers from view. Um, that's a problem. And as a result, only 50% of women in the U S who should be screened are ever screened. And we spent an enormous amount of money on that 50% that are very poorly served and we leave the other 50% behind. The second problem is that cancer, 30 years ago, when the guidelines were written, um, cancer was a disease of middle age to old age. Now that window has opened up to, to women in their 20s and 30s, or men too, for different types of cancer, in their 20s and 30s, so not disease. So cancer is not a disease of young to old, and there are no guidelines and there are no tools available for, say, women under the age of 40. Um, our test, you can start taking our test ARIA at age 30, you know, so we're opening up that window, opening up that window of screening. That's really amazing. It sounds like you're helping people get access to early diagnostics in this way. How much does it cost and is insurance covering it? So the test is $159 and that includes everything from the doctor's order up front, the kit, all the shipping charges, the lab test plus a consultation with one of our breast health specialists. And these are nurse or nurse practitioners with at least about 20 years of experience in the field to help guide you through the next steps. Uh, insurance does not cover it, not yet. Um, it's too early, it takes, takes a while for insurance to start covering things that, are, that come to market. And that's another one of the unique things about the US healthcare system is that uh, there are too many- It cases. sounds like an affordable option though, either way. It is, you know, people can use their FSA or HSAs on it as well. And um, right now we're selling through, you know, we have our B2C channels. So we sell it through our own e-commerce platform, Amazon, Walmart. We sell it to large employers, either directly through us or uh, through some partnerships that we have in this space. And, um, and we work with concierge medicine, functional medicine, medical spas, any place that people um, pay cash for healthcare. That's sort of like the channels we're using. We have a good partnership with a, uh, a, a lab services company that services that sector, a company called Avexia. They have 6,000 providers in their network and we're listed in their catalog of tests and, and available to their practitioners. I appreciate that, Omid. Thanks for sharing all that. Uh, it's really great to know that you know there is something out there that is truly affordable that people can leverage. Uh, speaking about you know money and things like that, I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the company's fundraising journey. So from the idea, and then, you know, about four years ago, you mentioned how it was acquired and created this new company. Can you discuss at what inflection points or discuss all the inflection points you had to go through 
in the last 10 years with Namita? Oh, wow. The last 10 years, um, the early, early days, we were funded by um, angels, by angels and, you know, grant money, non-diluted things. And, um, and mainly, mainly we carried that uh, through the whole, uh, through the whole sort of six years that, that, uh, that the previous company existed. And um, uh, one of the, one of the big problems we're having, we actually were, we had a different business model at the time. We were trying to make a cartridge, a disposable a disposable mm. cartridge, which we proved that it can, you know, our test can be read on a cartridge. Uh, but as you well know, that's a medical device and needs to go through the FDA. So around the time that we started raising money for that process, Theranos was going through its, uh, you know, its, uh, its downturn, let's just say. And uh, the book had just come out and uh, sort of like the fraud that was Theranos it completely killed any uh, any sort of uh, opportunity for fundraising for anyone in the mm-hmm. diagnostic space, especially if you're trying to trying to fund something as novel as looking for cancer markers and tears. It's it's sort of you know we were we were categorized in the same category as Theranos at that point, and um, and that that completely killed the, that idea. Hence the acquisition and and um, and creation of the new company un- under a new business model. I mean, our business model now, we sell a lab developed tests. So we have a uh, CLIA laboratory here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where, uh, where we are, that, uh, that runs all of our, our tests. So basically we took that, we took the work that we had done in Ascendant, our old company, and, uh, and put it under a new business model, validated the test as a lab developed test and got it to market as soon as possible. COVID delayed us a little bit in the middle there, but, uh, but, but we finally got it sure. to market last year. Can you name the company that acquired you? Oh, uh, it was, it was acquired by a PE firm and, uh, and then okay. they basically, uh, they basically created this, the, our funding today in this company, we have raised $10 million so far in a seed run around and then a safe round. And, uh, we're now in the market to, uh, raise our series A, which will get us to profitability. Do you know how much, what your target is for the series A and then. Uh, how are you planning to allocate that money? So we're, uh, we're raising somewhere between 10 to 20 million. And the reason that we have a range, part of it is, uh, is an answer to current conditions uh, among the VCs. And um, I would say probably the best description is that uh, confused. They, they, uh, they, they really don't know what they want to do at this point. 10 to 20, we're going to fund marketing and sales for ARIA fully. Either, either, either scenario from 10 to 20. The reason that we can have that range is because we have six R&D projects. So they're sort of modular. And uh, if we raise 10, we'll find, the, find our sales and marketing and revenue generation fully. And we fund two of our R&D projects and delay the rest to either get funded through revenue or, uh, or maybe a later round. 20 will give us full funding, half for sales and marketing and the other half for R&D on the six projects to bring those to market as soon as possible. Interesting. In addition to funding, are you looking for specific types of partnerships, potentially other labs or maybe clinicians or provider groups or something like that? What's your vision for that? Probably all of those. So, um, so where we can, where we can serve people and looking for partnerships, you know, we can help with the whole, um, dense breast problem. That is, that is a major issue today. And which uh, problem? Sorry, can you repeat that? Dense breast. Dense breast. So 50% of women have what's called dense breasts. And those, uh, the density uh, does not allow the, Im- uh, the x ray images to be uh, to, you know, to form mm. correctly. You cannot see cancers in dense breasts because dense breasts basically show white in, in an x ray. And that's what the calcifications look like as well. So that's, that's why the sensitivity or effectiveness of x rays for women with dense breasts is extremely low and, um, and a solution there, there's no, you know, there needs to be a solution for that. And we think we can provide that solution. So, um, so that, you know, partnerships around that, um, partnerships around serving that 50% of the population, many of them in lower socioeconomic um, status, serving those, serving those who are not being served, um, partnerships around, you know, um, providers, insurance companies, anybody who needs to get people in to get screened, because again, only 50% of women, uh, screen for breast cancer. And that is probably the best number for screening. Um, 
what has happened, even, even though cancers have become more deadly for younger people, half the, half the mortality in breast cancer in the US is in women under the age of 45, and many of them never screen. Um, and the fact that cancers have opened up from ages 20 to 30 all the way to 70s, our rate of screening have dropped overall. So we've gone from 28% about 10 years ago to 21% today. Breast cancer is an outlier in that because, because there's so many people, there's so many not-for-profit organizations that are basically advertising and making that an issue, getting people, getting 50% of women at least to, to screen. Other cancers, very, very low screening rates. So anybody who wants to get people to pay more attention to their health, uh, pay more attention to catching cancers early. So those are employers, those are insurance companies, those are ACOs. Uh, value-based care, anybody in that in that field. So we're looking for partnerships in those spaces. And to the larger lab companies, LabCorp, Quest, they're leaving a lot of money on the table because today mammography imaging is an incomplete solution for breast cancer screening. There is room for lab testing in there and they're leaving all those billions of dollars on the table. This is the business that they can own. Very interesting. Yeah, and I think you, you can imagine mammography testing might even be a little more expensive than $159, just thinking. Well, it's, it's covered by insurance, but uh, you're absolutely cool. true. Mammography is anywhere between 350, depending on where you are. So it goes, starts from 350 and then it goes up to, you know, six, $700. Is and that still the current gold standard though? In medicine? That is the gold standard. And there is a, uh, I mean, there, there's a little history lesson, which is kind of fascinating actually, if I may indulge. So. The first recorded case for breast cancer in history uh, was reported in Herodotus. So it was uh, 5th century BC. And uh, the first case that was reported by Herodotus is in, in his book uh, was Atusa, um, um, the queen of Persia, daughter of Cyrus the Great, the liberator of Jews from Babylon, as mentioned in the Old Testament. She felt a lump. and Basically, a, a Greek surgeon removed the lump from her breast and that saved her life. So from 5th century BC to about 1980s, that was the method. That was the gold standard of how you found breast cancer. You felt a lump. So in mid-80s, mid, mid, mid my old employer, Eastman Kodak, invented a new x-ray film that had much higher resolution. So we went from having nothing to something that was basically good enough for 50% of the population. And that's how mammography was born and how it got a foothold in the marketplace. So that's- It's very clear that you have the experience to be in this business and industry. So that's really amazing. And I'm glad you're putting your efforts and time and, and work into this, uh, hopefully to allow other women, and even men, to gain this kind of access. Um, you mentioned economic deal flow is sort of slowing down or maybe not as good as it used to be. Are you seeing 2024 as a more positive, uh, or do you think that environment is going to be better in 2024? It has, to be. It has to be better. Um, okay. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, a whole bunch of uh, VCs are going to have to start writing checks to, uh, yeah. to cover their costs because they're not, if they're not deploying money, they're not going to get their management fees. So this is just from practical points of running a fund. You, know, you, you pay for your salaries and your staff salaries and your office expenses through management fees. If you're not deploying capital, you're not getting your management fees. So unless they start deploying capital, they have to start writing checks to their own firms, the partners. So that's from just a practical point of view. But from an investment point of view, I mean, I've, I've raised money during bad times before. And typically at this stage, people would be looking for bargains. You know, they, they, can, they can negotiate a better deal. But I think everyone, at least until the end of the year, it seems like everyone's just sitting on their hands and just waiting to see if there's shoe drops. And, I, and some, of that, some of that, I mean, it's been puzzling to me. As I said, I have raised, I have raised money in tough times before. I mean, 2008 was tough for credit and, and for raising. I, I actually talked to a friend who runs uh, investment banking at, uh, at, at one of the, or life sciences banking in one of the big investment banks. And he said, have you looked at the life sciences, not the big boys, not, not the top five or six companies, but look at the stock price of the medium to small size, size life science companies, the public ones. And, and I actually went and looked and he's right. You know, some of these companies that have gone public in the last five years, they're down to penny stock levels, hmm. you know, that 
valuations of few billion dollars, maybe five years ago is down to like a hundred million, maybe to 50 million. I think that is, that is also what's spooking a lot of VCs because they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel for exits. And maybe they're just sitting on the cash to fund the companies that they have in their portfolios because they see that they're going to need a lot more capital because they are sort of uh, exitable. Anyways, those are just speculations. Sure. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing that too. And, uh, you know, I just want to sort of conclude here. Is there anything else you wanted to share before we end this conversation? Again, thank you so much for your time. Omid Mogadam, Namida Labs. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Ray. Enjoyed it. And if you enjoyed this show, make sure you follow, subscribe and like and comment. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, everybody.